The next part is design analysis, and this has been maybe the most tricky part to explain in a simple way what I have experienced, but um, I'll try. We know this traditional project phasing. That start with pre-design, then concept design, and so on. And as we can see on these images, they trying to reflect some kind of level of detailing. These images is from a Danish standard. They're trying to put these uh, detailing levels into, as what I would say, a rigid schematic structure. And it doesn't reflect at all the way a design process is. Because if you're a designer or an architect, you jump between different uh, scale of design and uh, changing all stuff all the time. So it's really tricky to jump into this process. Because of this jumping back and forth in scale of design, especially when you are a specialist or a consultant that doesn't work with the design, only consult and give feedback about how the performance is. How this process could be more efficient is something that I will talk about in part 4. There is no doubt about that you can get the most benefit on the urban level, making a good urban planning. And if you make a poor urban planning, then you have to go to the next step and try to see how can you make a good building form or shape, and then going down the ladder. You could say if you are, have a really poor design on urban or all this level, then you really need to take some good fabric decision or choose the right materials. And that is not possible at all to get the same level of performance if you have done it good in the beginning. Before jumping into the first section of this part, I just want to mention again what I talked about in, in the introduction, how important it is when we want to analyze something with simulation, it is all about comparing and only look at one parameter at a time, not different parameters in the same analysis. So, the first part here, it's about how important it is to understand the climate, understand all architecture because they really have adopted to this site climate and also adopted to the available materials in the area. So this climate and analyze of the old architecture is a really good starting point. And we also see it from, from nature, how good nature is good to adapt to the, to the climate. For example, if we look at the hot, humid climate, the plants have very thin leaves, so the wind can cool the leaves down and remove some of the heat these leaves get from, from the sun, for example. Or the cold, humid climate is about making very compact, so the leaves or the trunks don't lose energy or heat. Therefore, could these studies easily be translated into concepts or strategies for building design. I think we can learn a lot from, from this part. Of course, we are not building these kind of buildings. We are also building bigger buildings. But the principle of many of these uh, uh, old designs, there is a lot of uh, learning from that. So how do we know what kind of climate it is? First of all, it would be a good starting point to look at the temperature range then humidity, and based on that we can predict what kind of climate it is, as I just showed in the previous slides. And then uh, later, especially for the urban spaces, by analyzing the wind rows to get an understanding of which direction we have the most prevailing wind. Based on these simple analysis and information we get from the, the weather data. Defining if it's a place where we don't want to have solar gain, or in this climate in Denmark, solar gain can be a good thing that we could have in mind. So this is some basic steps you should do before going into design to understand what kind of climate it is. And then choosing strategies or design questions that is related to that site and climate. It would be stupid to look at the heat island in Denmark because we don't have the, that high temperatures, that would be a waste of time to going into that subject. That is something the weather data can tell us. Another way of looking at that could be done by analyzing the psychometric chart. And this chart, without going into detail, shows the different temperatures, humidity, and so on, the 
different weather metrics. And by combining these metrics, it is possible to define how much of the time the climate is inside a comfort zone. That's typical something like 20 to 26 degrees, depending on which index you're using of comfort. This tool is not an Autodesk product, but it's a free tool called Climate Consultant. And seen here in the marked area, we actually can see applied strategies that could be relevant for, for this climate. Another thing Climate Consultant have that no other tools that shows the psychometric chart is this one that actually shows some strategies that is relevant for this uh, climate or based on the weather data. This one I'll try to map the design strategies, scale of design and simulations. As an introduction for this section, I'll just briefly go through some suggested order on different types of studies. We have already been talking about climatic studies that I talked about in the previous section. So the next step would be, as I suggest, looking at areas, for example, surface areas, floor areas, compactness, and all these kind of metrics that is related to square meters or volume. As a next step, I would look at comfort before I actually looked at energy result and the energy performance. And the reason for that, I will come back to that, that in just a minute. After the comfort, I will look into the embody energy with LCA analysis. And as one of the last studies, look at energy use and energy performance. In this slide, I want to try to explain why I want to look at comfort studies instead of looking at energy studies. In my opinion, as an designer or architect, looking at comfort studies, it's much more related to the architectural thinking of how you experience the space. And by looking at comfort, you get another angle of study um, spaces, you could say. An energy number is quite abstract. Therefore, this is more relevant, I would say. Of course, this could be discussed if it's true or not. As I also have tried to visualize in this diagram, is that the exterior comfort or the exterior impact will of course have an impact on the visual and thermal comfort. Further, comfort studies is more qualitative and it's of course very subjective, but it's related to how you feel and sense the space. After you have optimized and used all kind of passive strategies for bring good visual comfort or thermal comfort, and first then look at how much energy does this building or space need to get the right comfort if the passive strategy is not enough to get it into the comfort zone. Because if you have created a good visual comfort in the same time with good thermal comfort, you will in the same time have very low energy use. So when we are talking about energy, it's more about a quantitative uh, metric and not related to how you feel space but you could say that the energy number or result is a summary for all kinds of metrics. The visual comfort related to uh, lightning and thermal comfort related to heating and cooling. All right, to explain some of these methods and strategies, I've been using this system or schematic overview to explain this. And I actually think it's quite good to tell the story. There is an extended version that I found and this one having the part that's quite important with the, with the climate as we see in the, in the first box. But actually I wasn't satisfied how the way it was shown or visualized this process. So I changed a little bit so I better could tell the story about the relation between strategy, scale of design and so on. So instead of looking at it as a linear process, I changed it into boxes that consist of different scale of design with related uh, design questions, as we can see in these different boxes. Because <clears throat> when you design, you're not only going from left to right. Very often you're working in different scale of design. Let's say you are looking at study of uh, the building form. You are maybe at the same time looking at study of the fabric, for example. So it's about taking the box and then you have the questions for that kind of box <coughs> or scale of design. So if it's on the urban level, it would be like, should I go for a compact or open city plan or 
what kind of orientation is a good idea. So it's about having related design questions for these different scale of design. Of course you could say that this is quite theoretical, but it's actually telling the story quite good with this schematic overview. Zooming in and to be a little bit more specific, this matrix could be used. It is from the same book. The matrix is trying to make relation between uh, the scale of design and these uh, design strategies that I showed in the previous slide. So I didn't have to invent the, the wheel again. I just reused some already known literature and methods. Again, I thought it was necessary to customize and adopt the matrix to my kind of thinking of this subject. Especially I thought that was missing design questions or strategies specific on the fabric level. As seen on the right, I have extended the matrix so it also creates relation to simulation types. Let me try to give an example by zooming a little bit in on the simulation types in relation to the design strategies and scale of design. As we can see on the simulation types, there is a difference between black and red. The red text is simulation that is not possible at the moment with Autodesk products. At this point it's only possible to do the things in black, so let's focus on them in this case. Further, there is also a difference between the light green and the dark green. The dark green, I would say it's more important than the light green. Let's uh, take compact or open as an example in the urban level. So the shadows will have an or could point you in a direction of if it should be compact or open. The same with the incident radiation because that is related as I mentioned earlier to uh, not only to overheating or passive solar gain, it's also related to daylight. The next is the wind pattern that could have an influence on the urban outdoor spaces. And next, the daylight levels. Now we are inside the buildings. We could always discuss if that necessary at this point. But as I, I will show in a later example, that you actually can do these kind of studies at a very early stage. With relevant and useful feedback, the same with the energy, it's also related to the daylight. It would also be interesting to look at LCA analysis as well as construction properties. The way you could look at that, that i also been talking about earlier, that is looking at square meters. Where is all the square meters? Is it on the facade or the roof? And of course, that will have a big influence. Either it's a compact or open structure you are choosing for the urban layout. So it's a way of putting into a schematic form of knowing that thing is not uh, working that way. But when you have to teach or explain th uh, things to others, then it's a good idea to have these kind of matrix and the scale of design with the different design questions. I hope these schematic views and matrix gives a little bit more meaning to what I'm trying to talk about in this section. And a little example, so it's not only about tables. So this is a, a, a typology study and a density study. So I, maybe I will say it's maybe two things in the same time. So maybe it, it's not me that I've done this. It's from a research part project that I might have been quite inspired uh, by uh, in relation to, to uh, these things I'm talking about. So maybe it should only have been uh, on the typology level, keeping the same square meters, and then another study where it only uh, was about density. But anyway, the interesting part is the result. It's not this one that is the most interesting part with the energy, I think. The one that I'm also building my argumentation up around. About how I read the radiation studies mentioned in part one. That is, when we look at solar gain and the daylight autonomy, then it actually follow almost in, in most cases. So if we have a radiation, it actually follow the, the daylight autonomy, as we see here. And why I'm also talking about uh, comfort would be the design parameter more than the energy parameter is that when we are optimized our building as much as, as we can with the insulation and so on, in this case there is only 20% in difference. But if we look at daylight, there should also be the thermal comfort on this one, then we actually have 50% in difference. So based on that, we have uh, more to gain or look at when we are talking about daylight, there's a bigger difference than we have on the energy part. I don't know if you follow me here, but... 
That is at least one of the arguments for looking more at comfort than on energy. If we should take the step further, then we actually should combining results. Like in this video, where this guy have combined wind study with radiation studies for each hour, because none of them as single simulation gives the full picture, either if it's wind study or radiation study. It should be combined with, for example, the radiation that brings heat as well as the temperature. Because it's a combined simulation, it is needed to create a new index or factor that describes this. In this case, it's a comfort index. And this is another example where this guy is creating a, another index of uh, looking at urban sites by combining radiation with temperature because in some cases the radiation could be good but is it depending on the temperature so if it's uh, cold then it's, it's okay to have a high uh, radiation and uh, the opposite of course when we when it's a high temperature then we don't want to have a lot of uh, radiation at this point we cannot do this in Revit but uh, with Dynamo I'm pretty sure that Soon we will, we will have the option of uh, combining these uh, metrics. So the last one is actually based on, uh, um, I did a presentation uh, three years ago, a little bit similar, but I've, I've learned from that. That's good. A uh, really schematic, rigid uh, methodology that didn't work in practice, so to say. That's why I developed this one. Having <coughs> linked to what we're actually doing in, in our models, this relation diagram Instead, that shows the different model detailing from Mars to object-based model. The idea is to map simulation to different level of model detailing. Many of the simulation tools actually have some kind of limitation. Either it cannot select special types of surfaces or similar. And these uh, model of detailing is related to what we actually can do in, in Rabbit. Therefore, this one was uh, developed based on that. Again, this methodology about box mapping. In this case, it's about level of model detailing and relevant simulations. And another main idea about this diagram is in fact, it's not related to any phases or whatever. You can use this diagram at all times in the design process. It's just about if you have a model, for example, I have a mass model. What can I do with this mass model? What kind of analysis can I actually do with this one? And then uh, trying to apply uh, some of the tools that we have with Autodesk uh, products. It's not covering everything, but a lot of the different steps is, is covered. And uh, maybe it will come in the future, I don't know. So onto then, of course, we need to use other tools that can cover these uh, missing part of these also very important simulations like thermal comfort. So what could we learn from design analysis? The key points again for this section, it doesn't have to be super accurate, the things we're doing, as long as they are giving us a direction to follow. In many cases, people are always asking, can we trust these tools? I would say, of course we can. These people are the experts. Who should we trust them? With the very early studies and these comparable studies, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, make more accurate simulation during the process but in the process it's better to do something than do nothing the second point here is about this box thinking and that was about thinking of framed analysis based on scale of design with relevant design questions as well as this model of detailing taking these two parts putting them together then you actually have what you need for doing more relevant and useful simulation to not only create better design but also to get a better process. That is something I will come back to in part 4. And of course design should not only be seen as individual parts, it should be like a holistic optimized design. Also I think I typically see that it's only focusing on one thing. It could give you a wrong result or point you in a wrong direction. For example, if you're only looking at daylight, then it may be not good for thermal comfort or energy use or LCA.